Welcome to lesson number 10 in module 215, Advanced Behavior Management and Programming. At the end of the last video, I asked you to pause and to journal about some of the possible reasons why a person with intellectual disabilities, mental illnesses, or physical disabilities might have such a high need or unmet need in the areas of power or attention. So let's dive into some of the answers I hope you might have arrived at. First, let's acknowledge that a lot of what we call ableism still continues to exist in our community. It's one of the last places where it's still somewhat socially appropriate for people to say and act in a way that's uh, stigmatizing and prejudicial to other people. And as a result of that, people are often socially isolated. Being friends with or being connected with somebody who has a disability or mental health issue can be really a challenge from the social perspective. That means that people with those needs are often the most lonesome in the world, the most rejected in the world, and they only have to turn on the television or get on the bus to hear lots and lots of examples of people feeling very comfortable using terminology and behavior that is flat out discriminatory. So that's gonna have an impact on people's low self-esteem. And people with these needs are often served in highly competitive environments where there's lots of people served and only a few staff. So in order to get attention and power in those environments, often the loudest or most, uh, most uh, aggressive or most perseverant person is going to get a larger slice of the pie, so to speak. Many people recognize that individuals with intellectual disabilities and mental health issues are going to behave in somewhat abnormal ways. But what the community does about that ranges quite a great deal. In the old days when we had institutions, everybody with those needs was put into a place that was just for them, quote unquote. And one of the things about that was that people could just continue to behave in a way that was socially abnormal in that setting. And the setting moved around those people. If somebody hit themselves, nobody was surprised. They would tie them into their bed or put them into a room and move on to the next person. Even though those institutions are mostly gone in this part of the world, those norms haven't completely disappeared. You'll meet people in the community, including merchants and bus drivers and even family members, who are just accepting of the fact that their child is behaving in a way that is socially disruptive. That would be probably okay if everybody in the community had arrived at some compact or agreement that that's what we were going to do, but we haven't. And so if a bus driver allows somebody to get on their bus and talk nonstop about their private life, and then that same person gets onto another bus later on, they may not find the next bus driver nearly as receptive. And the next thing you know, they're in trouble. And that's a real life story. I've literally been through that exact situation. So sometimes the social norms are less clear or are sometimes changed for people with intellectual disabilities and mental health issues. And that makes things really hard to predict. They're often in a lot of trouble. They don't quite know how to go about getting their social needs met. And that leads to the next thing. Sometimes people just literally have not got the social skills yet. It may be difficult to teach them. They may be slower in their ability to learn things. And they may lack the communication skills that are so often a big part of how we get attention and power in our lives. Our communities really value people who are not only intellectually advanced, but who are really communicatively advanced. If you can speak well, chances are you're a more powerful person. That's how you get elected, that's how you get promoted, that's how you get to be the captain of the baseball team. And so if you don't have good communication skills, chances are your ability to get people to pay attention to you or to listen to you has declined. Some of the people we support will literally lack a cognitive ability called theory of mind, which is a fancy way of saying they'll have difficulty understanding that other people have thoughts and feelings as well. So that can be particularly common in people with autistic spectrum disorders. Schizophrenia is another disorder where that might come up. And the ability to read the social fabric is often missing for some people as well. In other words, the ability to tell what people are thinking or meaning by behavioral nuances, tones of voice, or humor is a common one. So sometimes when you're talking to somebody with a disability, you think that you're being funny, but they receive what you're saying very literally. And so it doesn't always translate. And again, people don't necessarily make good connections when they don't have that ability. They don't know when somebody is saying, stay, uh, come closer or go away. And so sometimes they end up in trouble. 
When we're younger, when we're little, we literally don't understand that the world isn't all about us. We're egocentric. This was Piaget's idea. And because many of the people we're experiencing have a developmental disability, what we're literally saying is it takes them a longer time. They may be older chronologically, but still have some of the characteristics of a much younger person. And egocentrism is one of them. Sometimes people just literally do not understand that it's not just about them, that they're not the only person who has needs in a given social circumstance. If you and I, for example, were told that we were supposed to go out for a dinner party and we didn't really want to go, we might say, all right, I'm going to go anyways because it's going to be good for the rest of the people in my social circle. But many of the people we'll support just really don't have that ability to think about all the other people in that social circle's needs. And they just do what's right for them. And the most basic reason why people have these needs or have these attention seeking behaviors, seeking behaviors is because they work. At the end of the day, if people aren't responding to the behaviors that uh, are more pro-social, for example, raising your hand in a class, but they do respond whenever you yell and get out of your chair, well, you're going to stop using putting your hand up and you're going to start using yelling and getting out of your chair. So a lot of the time it's that simple. Really, the people in their lives have created this sort of circumstance by not responding to the behavior they should have been responding to and therefore creating a need for the person to do something else. And then that person's behavior begins to work better and that's what they go with. It's really important to remember that we all need attention and power. Really, these are the things that we uh, trust as evidence in our lives that we are loved, that we belong and matter to other people. And if we don't get much of them, then we start to feel less mentally and psychologically and physiologically well. As Maslow said, these are needs, not wants. And the need to belong is actually an underpinning of the need of self-esteem. We won't actually value ourselves first. We have to be valued or perceive that we're valued by others before we'll value ourselves. And even further to that, one of the most important things for us to understand is if we help people to meet their attention and power needs, chances are we're going to very rarely see any needs associated with revenge or low self-esteem. People don't get to the point of being angry and hurt if they have lots and lots of examples in their lives where they matter to other people and they feel good most of the time. And the same is true with their self-esteem related behaviors, the types of behaviors that cause people to simply withdraw or to try to get out of doing things that are psychologically challenging for them. So if we address attention and power, we address the vast majority of the behavioral problems that we might experience. This includes behavior that is socially disruptive or angry. We call these acting out behaviors. And a lot of times for us, people have a visceral in defensive response when they're around individuals who behave in these ways because they think of themselves as being threatened or they take it personally. In reality, a lot of times what's happening is that person's behavior is A, not at all personal. It has nothing to do with the specific staff person that's working with them. And B, it's often about expressing anger, not about being a threat. And that's something that a lot of folks have difficulty separating. We do not like it when other people are angry in our presence, but we also don't like it when we get angry and people immediately become judgmental or overreactive to us. So we need to step back in the same way as we hope other people will do when we are starting to get a bit upset. We hope other people will understand that we're trying to communicate a need when we're angry. And we need to be good at picking up on that need from the individuals we're supporting as well. That behavior could be about a need for attention or power. It could be the person's way of showing that they're hurt, even though they're showing it in a way that is vengeful or likely to cause hurt for others. Or it might simply be that they're ventilating excess frustration or energy. But the only way we can tell if it's one or a combination of those things is by stepping back and having cool heads do some assessment. It's critical that we assess by looking at things like what happened before the behavior that seemed to start it? Was the behavior directed at a specific individual? Was there an audience? Behaviors that are attention seeking or power seeking only occur when there's somebody else in the area who will notice. You don't go to a play when there's no audience. You don't act out towards somebody if there's no somebody. 
And one of the most important things we can do is to see what consequence comes from the behavior. Often, staff don't get the fact that the person is looking for the consequence they're providing, even though they might think they're applying some kind of logical or natural unpleasant consequence to the person doing the behavior, that consequence might be exactly what they're looking for. So you're having a strong emotional reaction and that is entertaining for the other person. Or you're telling the person that they cannot participate in an activity and they're actually happier to be outside of that activity. Those are just a couple of examples. And one of the best things we can do is look and see whether or not the consequence is actually making the behavior worse or better. And a really important but very simple rule is if things are getting worse, you stop doing whatever it is that's creating that intensity in behavior. In other words, stop doing it if it isn't working, step back and get some new ideas. Take a few moments to think about behaviors that you've observed from your family, from yourself, and think about the way that other people perceive them. Are they being perceived as a need or are people often defending themselves before they stop and think about what the other person wants or needs? What would happen if they did it the opposite way? What would happen if somebody looked past the rough edges of the behavior and helped the individual who is expressing themselves to meet their needs? Whether it's you, a child, or your spouse, take a moment to think about that and blog on it before we go to the next video.